Mr. Jeff. Yes, sir. Yes. Tell me about the first music that well, changed your life. I grew up, I was born in 43. Uh, and uh, I grew up in a household where my uncle Nat was listening to, uh, well, a little later than that, he listened to Miles Davis. And uh, he introduced me to Ray Charles when Ray Charles first hit, you know. And I certainly thank him for that. In fact, I was listening to some Ray Charles yesterday. It was just remarkable. You know, uh, just something. You know. uh, my mother was 16 when she had me. She was a kid. So within three, four years, I was dancing with her in the house. And she would dance me around. And, you know, You know, we heard like a lot of, like my father was into the big, big bands, you know, uh, and, he, and he loved, uh, uh, you know, Count Basie, of course, uh, Duke Ellington, and, uh, and Stan Kemp, and those kind of groups. That's what I heard. And then when, when we got into the 50s, you know, uh, Jackie Robinson had broken the color line in 47. I was at that game. That was uh, April 15th, 1947, I was at that game. Uh, I have a photograph of me with, in my little Dodger uniform. I was just high. <laughs> Fantastic picture, and I've used it on an album cover, so you can't use it. <laughs> and um, my grandmother, I think my grandmother took that picture. And you know, you see, you see uh, Blackbush Avenue, you see the, the, tr the, the trolley tracks, you see Coca-Cola sign in the background. Uh, and uh, um, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And then, of course, uh, I was a big Roy Campanella fan as well. And my, uh, my grandfather was a Willie Mays fan, which, you know, there were a lot of battles in the house. <laughs> but Willie Mays coming on the scene was just, you know, Jackie, you know, he was the first cat, and then Willie Mays came on the scene. He, Willie Mays was remarkable. He was something. He's arguably the best player of all time. Any, any Dodge fans who would hear me say that would probably straighten me up. But, you know. um, but the music I heard was the music, really, that my mother danced to me and then finally when I hit the big time in kindergarten <laughs> I was beginning to sing myself in front of the class you know? and uh, I got I got kind of distracted by my father and mother because I don't think they wanted me to be in the show business and for many years I uh, was a student and uh, traveled around a lot and Certainly had uh, some fantastic experiences, such as going to Italy when I was 19. Nobody in my family had ever been to college. My father worked two jobs to put me through school, and he did it for the same thing for my brother. And I was like, uh, and I look back on it now, and it's when I, and now is when I've been really thinking about it. It's been a long time since he's gone, and I really think about what an incredible man he was. Because of him, I, you know, I, I really have had the kind of life I've had. He gave me that life. You know, here I was. I was 19. I was in Florence, Italy. What the hell was that? I speak Italian fluently. I had so many opportunities based on him. You know, it's remarkable. You know? I'll wait till it comes around again to talk about some racial issues because I, I got a pocket full of those. <laughs> I just, I just I, I listening to people talk is that I just talked about the kind of New Haven and Connecticut thing, but along with that, I remember sitting with my grandfather at home at his house in D.C., and that was when my mom was uh, working in, at, at, in the ethnic music institute at Howard and so we would she would let us borrow some of the drums from West Africa at home 
So my grandfather fancied himself a kind of like local amateur drummer playing in places like called Bucket of Blood. <laughs> you know, oh, what did you play? What did you play, Grant? What did you play? Buck of Blood. <laughs> so we would be sitting in the living room, and he had to give up, basically, drumming when my mom was born. But when I came back, it was uh, super important. And so we would sit playing... Um, drums from Nigeria and Ghana, but we were playing brushes. So we were using hand drums and drums that were stick drums and stick and hand drums and, and using this new jazz brush on it. And that was it. That was that's a very um, uh, genesis moment in terms of my own conception of everything. <laughs> It's interesting you, you talked about coming back around uh, racial stuff because that's actually kind of at the heart of the, uh, the next question. Um, <coughs> I want to know when did um, just the whole notion of race, you know, and otherness and blackness and whiteness and these things come into you guys' lives in a way that was really uh, uh, definitive or eye opening or euphoric? <laughs> 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 I'll just do that in. <laughs> it, it, it's all very clear and vivid for me. I mean, uh, uh, things were right there in front of me, and uh, I couldn't help but uh, look at them and feel uncomfortable about them, feel frightened about them, and uh, begin my challenge uh, over the, you know, at seven years old. I remember when I was seven thinking, like, you know, <clears throat> I like had a like a fantasy that I knew what was good and uh, that, I, that I wish I could take this good and make the world into it. I had that feeling at seven. You know? I was going into the city at seven years old from Coney Island to Sheepshead Bay. I would go into the city and take piano lessons with my Uncle Dave uh, around there where, where Soho is now. Um, it was amazing. But my mother and father, especially my mother, she sort of like pushed me out of the house, really, to say the least, very young. And uh, I look at that as a benefit now. I mean, it's not something I would do with my kid, although my kid has started very young as well. She's 16 now. Uh, but I'll just say that, uh, uh, you know, I, I felt... Uh, a lot of rejection along the way in the very, very early years. And uh, since I was so uh, uh, light-skinned, you know, I went for, I, 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 I have a song that I wrote called Spanish Blood a number of years ago, because I'm, I'm quite a few different races, 20, 30 of them, I think. Uh, um, my grandmother's Rafaela from Puerto Rico. My grandfather's uh, Dave Bolden. He's uh, black and Indian. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, a mixture of these things. And, uh, um, uh, and I, I uh, you know, I, I, that's, you know, I was getting ready without knowing it so much, getting ready for the fight, you know, and the fight's been always there, you know. Uh, and I, I always wanted to do what it was that I wanted to do in terms of, say, my creativity. And uh, one of the things that I've done throughout almost all of my albums over all the years is talk about race in a way that I think people can hear it uh, and uh, take it in. Uh, uh, although, you know, it's funny, you know, you, if you're on Facebook, bring a picture up of, uh, say, uh, Coretta Scott King and somebody else, or, you know, you don't get as many uh, hits as you, as you do, uh, you know what I mean, in a normal setting, you know. So if you bring hot, hot topics up, you know, the hits come down. 
But uh, you know, when it's music, when you've got the music, the music can really support a lot of ideas. You know, and that's what I try to do is, uh, without being super conscious of it, it's just a natural inclination to uh, say that the, the ballad of me, which is a song, talks about black and white as black and white. I've gotten very good at it. I've gotten very good at it, at talking about this stuff and making it understood and almost appealing. Yeah. So I'll move off of yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to uh, just take a minute to have you talk about the song you performed at the um, Black Rock Coalition event, uh, Million Man Mosh. Um, yeah, but in particular, the one, the one about uh, I was afraid as a so I was afraid of Malcolm just like any white man. I was, I was afraid of Malcolm, just like any white man. Between the powder of the talcum and the color of a black man, fee fi fo fum. I was afraid of Malcolm and the Afro picks in the sand, just like any white man. And now I see I was dumb. I bought the whole big shebang. White man afraid of Malcolm. Hit me like a boomerang from the fire to the frying pan. I did the ostrich too. Cassius was a better man, but I took the white man's cue. I was afraid of Malcolm, and it goes on. You know, and it goes on. You know, uh, that's what I call writing a kind of song that's got some good information in it and having some fun doing it. Oh, my job. Who did race and beige your space? <laughs> race and beige. So, um, I guess my first notions of, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm mixed, so my mom is white, my dad was black, um, and I was raised primarily by my mom in, uh, in Chicago, which is a, still a very segregated city, so my experience of black community was usually, you know, once a year becoming less and less whenever I would visit my dad and he'd take me to the south side and we'd hang out with the black side of my family. Um, and, you know, now I'm very close with the black side of my family, but that's been through, you know, post my father's death. Um, so my experience of kind of otherness was always there since I was, um, you know, I was this brown girl in, in a big white family. My mom is the oldest of eight. Um, and weirdly, my white family, not weirdly, but from where I was standing, my, my notions of like angst came more from class because you know, I, would go to the, I would go to the South Side and be like, wow, these guys are living great. And my mom was from a very, very poor white family that was um, you know, just every, I, I, like, I could describe to you the um, the <laughs> the things I saw from just like you know my my grandparents' house just being decimated and like you know having really no walls between bedrooms and just like um, you know insulation just popping out of the walls. It was very poor poor white family. Um, so when I go to the south side, I'd be like, oh, this is looking pretty good. You know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I never really associated, I, you know, I, I sometimes feel like I've got kind of flipped views, um, um, or just not the same as, as kind of what I hear in, in some of these conversations, because my, my notion of blackness was, was always, you know, a, a better situation than my notion of whiteness. So, um, so I always felt, uh, felt very mixed, you know, and very just kind of like an observer on these, on these issues. Um, uh, yeah, is that, is that me? Um, whereas my, um, and, and then I went to, my, my mom got God very, uh, very early after kind of a, a, a hippie drug breakdown uh, when I was young, so, uh, 
she became kind of a Christian fundamentalist, you know, right, right at, right when I was like maybe six or seven. So, and and that community was very mixed. It was like every color of the rainbow that you could think of, um, where somehow in the hierarchy, Filipinos were like the kind of standard of beauty in my church and school, and that's who all the boys liked were the Filipino girls, and, and so. My, it, my notions of race were always just like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> um, uh, and just kind of that feeling of like, uh, eating, um, you know, my, like I, my, my issues or my angsty issues really came from kind of being, I felt suppressed by kind of a fundamentalist Christian, you know, atmosphere where where you know self-expression and making art was not really you know a respected profession it was not um, but going back to like where our first notions of music came from you know I felt very free when I could sing in the choir and sing you know I was always playing music and um, playing in the concert band but it was all very like religious material and, and hymns and you know, I've come to appreciate that kind of face now, but at the time, you know, there wasn't much culture that wasn't somehow Christian getting through to me, except for like Madonna, you know, or something that was like so shoved out into the um, into the culture that you couldn't help but notice it. Um, so I would say that literally in the past, you know, since playing in Earl Greyhound and actually getting the support of this amazing black community have I really felt a, um, you know, a, a kinship with black people because it was my, really my first experience of, of black community, um, you know, has been, has been here in New York, so.